Who is Paul Mitchell? Is he set to become the new sporting director at Manchester United? What experience does he have? And what would he bring to the club specifically? All the above will be answered in due time. But if you can, do leave a cheeky like of the video for us and subscribe to the channel. Let's dive into it. Now, Manchester United in the last couple of years, or last 10 years, I want to say, have become this kind of unidentified entity who have just made ridiculous signings for commercial and reasons and give out stupid wages, which has had a long-term effect um, on the club. If United were to appoint a competent sporting director like Paul Mitchell, like Michael Edwards, whatever kind of name you have in your head currently at the moment, I believe a lot of that weight would be removed from the operation. And it's something we've needed for a long, long time now. Someone who operates at a high level, has a track record at any club he's been to, and is one of the very best in the business. That's what this badge should have, right? That's what I think we, we can all agree with that. You can forget transfers and, and other things just for the moment because obviously that's the shiny thing that everyone wants to go to. But just the way he would work and the way he would change the future for the next 10 years is really interesting to me. And that's what I want to talk about today. Of course, naturally, people will mention the work that he done at you know Southampton, uh, M even MK Dons, Leipzig, Spurs... Um, other clubs that he's been at, like he's he's been phenomenal wherever he's been, and the transfer record speaks for itself in terms of recruitment. But there's a lot more to a sporting director than just that. So do feel free to drop your opinion in the comments section if there's a certain other sporting director you would go for and what reasons why you would go for that particular individual. Um, and just talk to me about the role in general. Leave a comment. Let me know. Let's have a chat. So the first natural question, any kind of fan, pundit, ex-player, wh whoever it is, the first question they would ask is why? Why are we in this situation where we need a sporting director? Why have we been in this situation for a long, long time? What has brought this to a level of expectation now? Um, of course, with all the bidding going on with the Glazers and the, the, selling, the selling of the club, um, it seems, you know that Jim Ratcliffe is getting closer and closer to taking over um, with himself and Ineos being heavily involved in just sporting matters, which obviously would be 25% stake in Manchester United. Um then it's like you start asking questions, well, who's going to come in? Who's he going to remove? Will John Murtagh and Richard Arnold be at the job centre on Monday, you know, asking for a job at Alde? Who knows? You don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of kind of questions that are floating about at the minute and United fans are getting a little bit itchy. Regardless, I think one thing we can all agree on is the fact that this club has lacked leadership and direction from the very top for a long, long time now. We had idiots like Ed Woodward playing football manager for... Basically, bringing players in for commercial reasons because, you know, they had a certain name and you're going to sell a certain amount of shirts. It was a banker doing a football person's job, effectively. And that's why we are currently in the mess that we are right now. I think one huge mistake we made was letting Ralph Ragnick go because his mind, any time he had a press conference, I'm going to dive into some of his quotes a little bit later on, but any time he had a press conference, the guy just spoke sense. Now, whether people didn't like it because he was airing um, you know, the, the club's dirty laundry or whatever it was. I thought, personally, it was kind of refreshing for the fans. It was nice to hear. Everything he was saying was absolutely spot on. Um, and great minds think alike. And he's obviously really good friends with Paul Mitchell. Um, I mentioned before players being mentioned. I think Ragnick uh, spoke about, who was it, Nkunku, Enzo Fernandez, Julian Alvarez, Gavardio, Luis Diaz, Haaland. Like, it was clear he had an eye for talent. And he also had a footballing philosophy, which a lot of people resonated with. And I think Paul Mitchell carries that same aura and would bring the same qualities. So if you actually dive into his work, just to start off with the players that he's brought in, MK Dons is where he, where he started. He was an ex-player, a former player, didn't really work out. He was okay, but just an average player, basically. But his mind was was the biggest asset for Paul Mitchell. Um, and he kind of moved into this role at MK Dons, brought through players like Deli Alley, um, Alan Smith, to be known, obviously played for Manchester United. And then he went over to Southampton, worked with Poch, brought through players like Sadio Mane and Dusan Tadic, went to Spurs, you know, um, scouted Song Hyung Min, who's arguably the greatest Asian player ever. Um, you know, top three at least. And then he brought through players like Kieran Trippier, who's had a long, stead career. Fantastic player, unbelievable for Newcastle at the moment. Um, and it's been really good for England. Alderweireld. And then he went over to Leipzig, worked with Ragnick there, had a close relationship with Ragnick. 
um, and, and oversaw you know certain football operations and did really well there. I mean, Leipzig's one of them kind of conveyor belts for talent anyway, but some of the players that came through there, I mean, the record is undeniable in it to start with. So obviously, when you're going through your checklist, you're like, yeah, obviously the guy's got an eye for talent and that's exactly what we need because when we spoke about recruitment, we have been horrendous the last 10 years. We just signed obvious signings and even then the obvious signings don't work out. So that is something that we, we definitely need to improve on. But if you ask yourself now a genuine question, if you had half the competence of a Paul Mitchell or someone like that, you would still do a better job than John Murtor and Ed Woodward and these kind of guys because they've been shit. They've been absolutely shit. We've really struggled ever since David Gill left. A lot of people speak about Fergie leaving and obviously that was a massive hole um, that was left behind, but David Gill was a big part of that as well. Then we talk about the money that's been wasted. Absolutely pissed millions of pounds um, down the grid. And you, you look at the players, the, the, the top five most expensive signings in United's history, right? Where are they today currently? Paul Pogba. Do we, need, do we even need to say it? He's gone to Juventus. I think he's played like eight games in total and he's currently serving a ban um, for doping. I think he had t- t- testosterone or something along the lines of that. Lukaku's on loan at Roma because his transfer turned into a shit show and no one wanted him. I think it was Juventus fans who didn't want him. Inter fans didn't want him. Chelsea fans... Um, didn't want in there, so that's turned into an absolute mess. Harry Maguire was never an £80 million defender, and when you consider what Liverpool got for Virgil van Dijk, not even close. It's absolutely miles apart in terms of quality, etc. Sancho's thrown his toys out the pram, like he has done previously at many other clubs before, so obviously the the scouting and the in-depth look at him. I mean, you only have to go on the internet and have a look at his time at Watford, his time with City, his time with, like, anywhere he's been, he's always kicked up a fuss and he's always been kind of these issues. So it's like they never even looked into that, like certain personality traits and behaviours. I think right now, if Eric Tanag was signing the player, and even if Sancho was still at Dortmund, no, I don't think he'd sign him. I really, really don't. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. And then we ridiculously overpaid for Antony. Because we panicked last minute, we was looking at Rabio and and, uh, and and out of it, and the fans turned against that. So it was like, shit, what should we do? And I was like, right, let's just go get Anthony there. And then by that point, Ajax was like, fuck off, mate. We're not selling him unless you give us ridiculous money. And United went, no worries, mate. We'll give it you right now. So, yeah, that's almost £400 million spent where none of the players have really worked out, whether they're still here or whether they've left the club. There's question marks everywhere. Then we have to talk about the amount of managers that we've been through, all different kinds. We've gone from David Moyes, who is, I know he said it was Fergie's choice, but he was never ready for that job. Um, such a huge job, a huge shoes to fill. Maybe Mourinho straight after um, Fergie would have been good. But yeah, David Moyes to Louis van Gaal to Jose Mourinho, to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, then to Ralph Ragnick as like on an interim basis, which was just a mess. And now to Eric Tanag, each coach having different philosophies, different styles, and given so much power because the Glazers have never relinquished power for a sporting director. So you've seen at the minute with Eric Tanag especially, the players, he's having to kind of scout his own players and he shouldn't be doing that. He should be fully focused on the football in hand. We need a high-level expert who should be in charge of things like this. Why a, a team like Manchester United should not have the manager doing everything? I know Fergie used to do everything back in the day um, and, and did a lot of it, but it's, it's changed now. It's completely different. It's not like you're saving money to not buy one. Like It's it's so bizarre to me. You know, I, I think a sporting director as well, it's not just the recruitment side of things that you have to do. you got to work with the head coach and the CEO, discuss budgets, buy and sell players, you know, how we offer existing contracts um, that have to be earned, not just giving them out willy-nilly like an idiot, like Ed Woodward did. And even with Paul Mitchell's experience, he's managed to do it at smaller clubs with a much smaller budget. So it makes you question, you know, the opportunity is absolutely massive at Manchester United. Can he do it? I thought his comments on Manchester United um, a year ago, I think it was, or just over a year ago, when Eric Tenag was taking his first pre-season in charge. We were just coming off one of our worst seasons ever. if Well, the worst season ever, let's be honest. Absolute disaster. Um, and he got asked to comment on us. And I thought it was interesting. Let's just, just read some of them out. It's a synonymously big club, isn't it? It has such a role and reach. Um, and there has been some tough times there. It is sometimes hard to comment when you're not in the internal and always understanding the context. I use that word a lot because I think context is important to measure what Manchester United's current situation is. But I think they do need to get to the point of really putting down what Manchester United needs to be in the modern game. We are a long time away from Sir Alex Ferguson era. Eric Tanag is a top coach from Ajax, but they need a top blueprint, not only for now, but for the next five years and to work towards that. And sometimes on that journey, there are hard moments when you don't get the right results. 
even though you're doing the right things, you have to know that over that period, the consistency of the decision making will yield a good result in the end. I think we've seen that with both Manchester City and Liverpool, that when you adopt that long-term strategy, you can get real consistency and sustainable success. I think that's the biggest thing for Manchester United, putting down their ident identity, which we still haven't found yet, um, of what they want to be today, but most crucially, what they want to be in five years' time and where they want to be and what they want to look like, from everything from young players to the style of play to the whole culture piece in Manchester United. And just listening to that, I was like, yes, yes, yes. Yes, 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 please, yes. That is what I want to hear. That is what United fans want. Even just speaking to people, you know, on the channel, fans, etc. That that is a tick list. It's ticked everything there that we need um to hear a vision, a crystal clear plan. Um, and what was it, Ralph Ragnick said in that press conference? It was um the the good thing is one one of the few things it's crystal clear. You don't even need glasses to see it. I think it was something like that. Um, I've got the quote here. Now, it's only about how you can solve them, not minor cosmetic things. This is an open heart operation. If everyone realizes it has to happen and works together, it doesn't need to take years. It can happen within one year. Other clubs have shown it's possible um, within three transfer windows. And Eric Tanak also needs that kind of environment around him where he can just focus on football and put 100% into it. He needs a proven guy like Paul Mitchell, like I touched on before. You need to modernise this football club. The recruitment needs to be spot on. You know, you can only look over at Brighton at the minute and what they're doing on, on the budget that they have and just admire them. And they're, they're the kind of people that we need. You know, we need the best in class and just signing players as well that aren't obvious. I think that's, that's a huge thing for me. You know, Brighton have found gems like Matoma, Casado, McAllister, like all these guys who have been extremely successful um, in the Premier League and that's exactly what I want as well as you know United have got the cash to spend big so you, they can spend big on certain players but have that blend of both for me and then that's massive now Paul Mitchell coming in doesn't equal instant success it doesn't even mean to say that he's going to do a fantastic job there are obvious risks involved you know if the Glazers are still there how much power will he get I still have reservations about that what happens to John Murta and Richard Arnold are they just going to go into another role or stay about and linger um, and he's never done it at the club uh, at the size of Manchester United, as much as it's a huge opportunity because of that, it's also a lot of pressure because, well, the pressure's more at United. It's just as simple as that, whether you've been at Southampton, Spurs, Leipzig, wherever. United's one of the biggest clubs on the planet. But it does seem like the move is likely. Um, I believe his family have just moved back to Manchester. He's keen on working in the Premier League. So Jim Ratcliffe has, uh, has lined him out um, as the next kind of sporting director that he wants. So all the stars are aligning together for this to happen. Um, and obviously, Sir Jim Ratcliffe owns Nice. Paul Mitchell was at Monaco, the sporting director there. So there's probably been contacts as well, I imagine. And we've also had outlets like The Telegraph and Sam Wallace reporting that um, he should be United. Well, it looks like he's going to be United's next sporting director. So it seems pretty promising for the moment. But let's see what happens in the future. I think this would be a very positive step forward for Manchester United and hopefully it happens. So yeah, if you've enjoyed this content, you've enjoyed this section, you have any questions about Paul Mitchell whatsoever or any thoughts at all, please do leave them in the comments section. Leave a like on the video for us if you've enjoyed this one and subscribe to Real Reds Talk. Have a lovely day, everyone. Peace.